Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this, the fourth in our series of Time Charters talks. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about hire and withdrawal. Okay, so first of all, just to introduce or to reintroduce Sarah and myself, uh, we're both senior associates in the Burkitt shipping team. Those of you that have heard some of the previous talks may have already had the dubious pleasure of listening to Sarah and I speak on, on the course uh, already. Um, there you have the shipping family tree and you can see Sarah and I sat there in the in the middle of the shipping team. Before we kick off with the talk, um, there's just one general point I want to make um, in relation to time charters and off hire. Um, and you'll, you'll hear um, us refer to the idea of off hire throughout our talk. So for anyone who's really new to this, I think it would just be helpful to briefly explain what off hire is. Um, and off hire is where the charterers uh, have a contractual right to withhold hire during periods that they're deprived of the use of the vessel. Okay, in very simple terms. So when you hear us talk about off hire, that's what you need to have in mind. It's, it's a clause in a contract that says to the charterers, you're entitled to withhold uh, payment of hire uh, during periods where you don't have use of the vessel. So just keep that in mind as we move through, through the talk. And without further ado, uh, on to just to introduce what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so those of you who were here for two talks, two talks ago, um, we talked about charterers' rights and owners' obligations under time charters. Well, now we're going to flip that around and look at owners' fundamental right to be paid higher and the corresponding obligation that charterers have to pay, higher, to pay higher punctually uh, and on time. Generally, hire is payable from the delivery of the ship until the redelivery of the ship. And it's an absolute obligation for charterers to pay on time unless one of a limited number of circumstances apply where the charterers have the right to make a deduction. And we'll have a look at those permitted deductions a bit later in the talk. Where the charterers fail to comply with their obligation to pay on time, the owners may have a right to withdraw the vessel. Uh, in other words, to terminate the charter. And Sarah is going to look in some detail at withdrawal and anti-technicality notices in the middle of the talk. And then finally, we'll just wrap up by having a look at the possible damages claim that owners might also have in conjunction with the right to withdraw the ship. So that broadly is the structure of the, of the talk today. Um, the way that I'm going to approach this, I thought it would be helpful in the first instance just to have a look at the hire regime in the MYP 1946 form. And this is set out at clauses four and five. Clause four we can deal with very briefly because all clause four really does is sets out the rate and it sets out that the vest, that hire is payable from delivery until redelivery. The rate in the original uh, 1946 form uh, was set out on a monthly basis. Obviously, uh, very often in modern day charter parties, uh, a daily rate is expressed in, on, a, on a per day pro rata basis instead. But this is actually an amendment to the, um, the original wording of the 1946 form. That's all we need to say about clause four. Excuse me. Moving on to clause five, which is the more complex and interesting clause that sets out the mechanism for the payment of hire. Um, we'll just read clause five together and you can see that there are some points that I've underlined in bold, which, are, which we're going to look at in more detail on the slides that follow. So pursuant to clause five of the MYP 1946 form, payment of hire is to be made in New York in cash, in United States currency, semi-monthly in advance, and for the last half month or part of same, the approximate amount of hire, and should same not cover the actual time, hire is to be paid for the balance day by day as it becomes due, if so required by owners. Otherwise, failing the punctual and regular payment of the hire or on any breach of this charter party, the owner shall be at liberty to withdraw the vessel from the service of the charterers without prejudice to any claim they, the owners, may otherwise have on the charterers. Okay, so just take a moment to just, just familiarise yourselves with that clause, and then we'll move on and have, have a look at some parts of it in a bit more detail. Great, so the way that we're going to break down the, uh, the talk today is to talk in general terms about five topics. So first of all, there's the obligation to pay higher semi-monthly in advance. Then we're going to look at the time and the mode uh, that charterers are obliged to adopt when paying higher. Then we'll have a look, as mentioned a moment ago, at some of the permitted deductions. Sarah's going to look in detail at withdrawal and anti-technicality notices. 
And then finally, we'll touch on the potential uh, uh, claim, claims for damages that owners might have at the same time as the right to withdraw. Okay, so first of all, semi-monthly or monthly in advance, this is when charters are obliged to pay higher. Now, very often, semi-monthly is actually replaced by monthly in the 1946 form, and monthly means per calendar month, pretty straightforward. So if the first instalment is due on the 10th of January, the second instalment will be due under a monthly regime on the 10th of February. Uh, and, and it's due on the same calendar day per month. If there's no corresponding day, then the higher instalment is due on the last day of the month. So, for example, if the first higher instalment was due on the 31st of January, then the second higher instalment will be due on the 28th of February on a monthly basis. Charterers will usually have until midnight in the place where the payment is made to pay. So if, for example, the charterers are based in New York and the owners are based in Tokyo, then the owners will need to wait until midnight in New York before exercising any rights arising from charterers' late payment. Similarly, even if owners know that it's not possible for charterers to make a payment on time, they must wait for that deadline to pass. So, for example, if owners know that the bank closes over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, and by the close of business on Friday, charterers haven't paid higher, higher falls due for payment on the Sunday, so owners know that charterers can't possibly meet the requirements under the charter party, owners must nevertheless wait until midnight on Sunday night in the place where payment is being made before they exercise any right to withdraw realistically on Monday. If the owners were to try to exercise a right to withdraw on the Saturday, for example, this would be a wrongful withdrawal and the charterers would have a damages claim against owners. The, some of the time charter forms, including the MYP 93 and the bold time forms, uh, use uh, references to 30 days or 15 days in advance rather than semi-monthly and monthly. And indeed, in many modern charter party forms, this approach is adopted just because it's more modern and it, and it gets rid of some of the confusion that can arise from semi-monthly and monthly. So you'll often see 15 days and 30 days in advance instead. In terms of the meaning of payment in advance, well, again, this is fairly self-explanatory, but what payment in advance means is that the owners uh, must have the funds freely at their disposal uh, by the due date or by the, by the end of the due date. Charterers are obliged to pay for every hour of the following period in advance, and this applies even where both parties know that there's going to be a period of off hire in the subsequent period. We're going to have a look at a case called the Lehigh in a few slides time uh, that illustrates this quite neatly. The charterers uh, may, however, be entitled to an adjustment on hire where there's been an earlier off hire event. So, for example, if, a, if there's been an engine breakdown that's deprived the charterers of the use of the vessel for a period in the previous uh, period of 15 days or a month, then owners may be obliged to adjust the hire um, for the period for the hire instalment that follows. Um, and the obligation to pay hire may be suspended if the vessel is off hire at the date that the instalment falls due. Now, this will depend on the terms of the particular off hire clause. Uh, and for example, clause 15 of the MYP 46 form um, provides that the payment shall cease in the event of an off hire event. That's been held to mean that where there's an ongoing off hire event at the date that the hire instalment becomes due, then charterers may be uh, excused payment of that hire at that time. Oh, let's go back one. OK, and then just briefly to deal with the first and the final instalments of hire uh, under a time charter. Well, usually the uh, first instalment of hire uh, is pay payable in advance of delivery. Um, with regard to re-delivery, if the, if the charter party is silent on when any final instalment must, must be paid or, or, or the amount of fi the final instalment, then the assumption is that a full instalment must be paid even where it's known that the vessel will be re-delivered before the end of the final hire period. The owners will then be uh, obliged to make a reimbursement at the end of the charter party uh, to reflect any unused period of the for the vessel. However, most charter parties, uh, most time charters now will include a wording that allows for charterers to make a reasonable estimate of their use of the vessel for the last hire period. Uh, and this is what clause five of the MYP form does. Uh, and then it goes on to say that in circumstances where charterers underestimate, then they'll be higher payable on a daily basis for any balance of the charter period. 
Sometimes as well, uh, ch time charter forms would allow for deductions from the uh, final instalments of hire uh, for other items. For example, the 90 MYP 93 form allows for adjustments to the two final hire instalments, including in relation for bunkers remaining on board at re-delivery. But it is very important just to read the specific hire terms in the charter party to see what your charter party provides in relation to each of these points. In terms of the mode of payment or the way that charters are obliged to pay, pay hire, the MYP 46 form provides for hire to be paid in cash. But obviously, it's not required on charterers to turn up at owner's premises with a bag full of used dollar bills each time a hire instalment falls due. Instead, what the courts have held is that rather than taking the reference to cash literally, the requirement is to, to make immediate and unrestricted use of funds available to owners by the within the relevant deadline. Very often, payments are made in the modern world by means of the SWIFT payment system. And in the SWIFT payment system, the charterers will give an instruction to their bank to make the payment. And then the, uh, the charterers bank will go via perhaps a chain of intermediary banks before the instruction arrives with the uh, receiving owner's bank uh, for the payment to be credited to the owner's account. And in relation to SWIFT payments, it's usually the interbank value date of the receiving bank that qualifies as the date that the payment is held, held to be made. Now, there is some suggestion that it may be sufficient for charterers to show that they've given an irrevocable instruction to pay to their bank in order to meet the requirement to pay on time. However, we would suggest that if you're charterers and you're finding yourselves in a position that you need to rely on this argument in circumstances where owners are exercising a right to withdraw, then you're playing a dangerous game. Now let's have a look at deductions. So if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I explained that the obligation on charterers to pay higher is an absolute obligation. It's, it's of key importance to the charter party and it's of key importance to the relationship between the parties and to owners ability to actually carry out their function. So generally hire is to be paid without set off. However, a limited right to make deductions might apply in three specific circumstances. First, there can be an express right to make deductions pursuant to the terms of the time charter. Second, the owners may be obliged to make an adjustment to hire due to a off hire event that's already occurred. And third, there may be a corresponding right for charterers to set off a damages claim where equitable set off applies. Now, off hire and equitable set off are going to form the subject for the next talk in our time charter series. But just to touch on these very briefly, I've already explained that an off hire event is a contractual right for charterers to withhold payments of hire uh, during a period when they're deprived of the use of the vessel. Now, often in those circumstances, a corresponding damages claim can arise where the uh, event that's depriving the charters of the use of the vessel also amounts to a breach of the charter party by the owners. So take, for example, um, the example of a mechanical failure depriving charters of the use of the vessel for a period, a period of time. That could give, give rise to a right of off hire. Equally, that could arise, that, that could amount to a breach of the provisions in the charter party relating to the maintenance of the vessel and give rise to a corresponding damages claim. And in those circumstances, the charterers could be entitled to offset that damages claim against hire that would otherwise be due. As I say, we'll look at this in a bit more detail in the next talk. What we're going to concentrate on today is where the charter party sets out express rights of deduction. Often these express rights, uh, and this is certainly the position set out in the MYP and bold time forms, will include elements such as off hire, owner's disbursements, fuel used in domestic consumption, which we understand to mean fuel used by, by the ship for its accommodation uh, purposes and that kind of thing, brokerage, re-delivery bunkers, as is the case in the, 19, the MYP 1993 form, as I mentioned a moment ago, cash advances to the master, for example, and there could be many other express rights to deduct. The types of claim that have been held not to qualify uh, for deductions against hire are general damages claims, so claims that do not deprive the charterers of the use of the vessel, and also cargo claims. You cannot offset cargo claims against hire. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that just to um, kind of tie up, tie up 
tie off and bookend this um, the first three topics, um, we'd have a quick look at the Shell Time 4 regime um, alongside the NYP regime for comparison purposes. What the Shell Time 4 hire clause says is that subject to clause 3 and 3E, payments of hire shall be made in immediately available funds in US dollars per calendar month in advance less and so this is where the Shell Time 4 form actually sets out expressly the deductions that charterers are entitled to make. Any hire paid which charterers reasonably estimate to relate to off-hire periods, any amounts disbursed on owner's behalf, any advances and commission thereon, and charges which are for owner's account pursuant to any provision hereof, and any amounts due or reasonably estimated to become due to charterers under clause 3C or 24 hereof. Clauses 3C and 24 are the off-hire clause and the clause relating to the speed and consumption of the vessel, respectively. The clause goes on to say that any such adjustments to be made at the due date for the next monthly payment after the facts have been ascertained. OK, so again, there's this notion that any adjustment has to be made to uh, hire instalments that fall after the event and the facts have been ascertained, not before. Now, the balance of this clause here sets out the Shell Time 4's anti-technicality provision, which I won't read now, um, but Sarah might mention briefly in her talk in a moment. OK, and, and finally, just to provide um, a, what, what I think is a really useful example of some of these points, um, the 2005 case of the Lehigh uh, was a, a situation that arose uh, in relation to a vessel that was chartered uh, for five to seven months uh, on the MYP 1946 form uh, with an option for charterers to extend. And there was a dispute over bunkers which arose where in August 2003 uh, the ship stemmed bunkers at Santosh. The owners took the view that these uh, there was a problem with these bunkers and they were off spec. And the charterers disagreed but the owners required the charterers to remove the bunkers uh, from the tanks and to clean the tanks before stemming fresh bunkers at Hong Kong. The charterers uh, agreed to this under protest um, and as a result they incurred a $500 cancellation fee to their bunker supplier at Hong Kong. Now, the next hire instalment, so, so this, this dispute arose uh, in September 2003. There was a hire instalment due on 13th of October 2003 and the parties knew that following the payment of that hire instalment the vessel would go into dry dock for a period of I think around eight days. On the 9th of October, so a few days before the, the higher instalment became due, charterers told owners that they were going to withhold sums from the 13th of October higher instalment in relation to the bunker cancellation fee and the future dry dock. Owners responded claiming full payment and they issued what was purportedly an anti-technicality notice, which Sarah will talk about in a moment. Charterers paid hire for the dry dock period under protest, which was by far the largest part of owners' claim, but for some reason they withheld the $500 bunker cancellation fee. Owners withdrew the vessel on the basis of the underpayment of hire in the sum of $500. So this went to the uh, High Court in London, and the court held Charters had no right to deduct for future off hire, so they were right to pay the uh, hire in respect of the dry dock period, and it would be down to owners to then make an adjustment from a subsequent period of hire to reflect the period while the vessel was off hire in dry dock. The court also held that the charters were not entitled to withhold the $500 cancellation fee from hire. Again, they had to pay this and bring a, a, a separate damages claim because there was no permitted deduction to withhold the cancellation fee. As a result of that, it, on a first up basis, the owners had a sustainable right to withdraw the vessel, subject to making sure they complied with the technical requirements to withdraw the vessel properly. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pass over to Sarah to talk about withdrawal. Right, so as Tom said, um, I'm now going to talk about withdrawal. So provided a charter contains an express right to withdraw, and subject to any anti-technicality clause, which I will discuss in a moment, if a charterer fails to make punctual payment of any hire instalment, the owners are, at the moment the hire is late and not before, entitled to withdraw the ship from the charterer's service and bring the charter to an end. If a vessel is withdrawn from service, the charter is terminated. It's perhaps worth noting that there's no implied or common law right to withdraw in these circumstances. 
and an owner can only rely on an, an express right in the charter, albeit most of the standard time charter forms do contain that express right. Now this right arises not only where there is a complete failure to pay any hire, but also when payment is made of less than the amount due and there is a balance outstanding on the date that hire is due. Now this particular point, so, so payment of less than the sum due was recently, or in 2019, considered by the courts in a case called the Caravos Liberty. In that case, a deduction was made from a fourth hire instalment. Owners protested, but they did not withdraw. When the fifth and sixth hire instalments were due, owners repeated that there was an outstanding balance from the fourth hire instalment. But again, those sums that, that, that outstanding balance was not paid. When the sixth hire payment was made, say, in full, but without that additional sum from the fourth hire instalment, the owners served an anti-technicality notice, and again, I'll discuss that in a moment, and withdrew. Now, the court found that the right to withdraw was tied to a particular hire instalment, and therefore owners' withdrawal after the sixth hire instalment, which, as I said, was paid in full, was unlawful. Now, this case concerned the BIMCO non-payment of hire clause, and it's unclear at this stage whether the same principles would apply on other wordings, and it's likely to depend on the particular wording in each case, but it's an important case to note as it shows that uh, you, uh, an owner can't rely on a previous short payment under a separate hire instalment to withdraw at a later date. If a charter attenders payment late, but before an owner has given notice that they withdraw, owner's rights are not lost and the owner retains their right to withdraw. And I want to put that differently, a charter cannot necessarily save the charter by paying late. If on the other hand, a charter is a habitual late payer, they may seek to argue that an owner who has previously accepted late payment is a stop from exercising a right of withdrawal. Now, this point was considered by the Court of Appeal in a 1983 decision called the SCAP trade. In that case, the court held that in order to rely on an estoppel argument, a charter would need to demonstrate that owners had represented unequivocally that they would not enforce their strict legal right to withdraw. Therefore, any charter wishing to rely on an estoppel argument runs a very real risk, and the fact that an owner may previously have accepted, say, one or two hire instalments late without complaint is unlikely to be enough on its own to create an estoppel. So exercising the right to withdraw. In order to do so, a notice of withdrawal must be given by the owners to the charters and not to anyone else, and that includes giving the notice to a master or any other third party. The notice must state clearly in its terms that the owners are exercising their right to withdraw. If the notice leaves any room for doubt or leaves owners with an option to continue the charter or temporarily withdraw, it will not be sufficient. It's an all or nothing decision. But, but no particular words are needed. As said in the Agnusiotis, the notice must be unequivocal that the owner is treating the non-payment of hire as having terminated the charter party. Now, an owner can waive their right to withdraw the ship if they elect to treat the charter as continuing, and this can be done by the words or by conduct. If an owner accepts late payment without any protest or reservation, then the owner is likely to waive their right to withdraw for that particular late payment. But note, this is not the same as payment simply being made late, which does not automatically result in the right to withdraw being lost. Rather, it requires an act by the owners, evidencing they intend the charter to continue. If on the other hand payment is made on time, but of an insufficient amount, the acceptance of that short payment is unlikely to amount to a waiver of the right to withdraw if the short payment is not made good on or before the due date. Now in terms of the timing of communicating withdrawal, owners have a, a reasonable time in which to give notice, but you might very fairly ask, what is a reasonable time? Well, in the Laconia, Lord Wilberforce said, and I'm going to quote here, Essentially, it is a matter for arbitrators to, to find. It depends on the circumstances. In some, indeed many cases, it will be a short time, the shortest time reasonably ne necessary to enable the ship owner to hear the default and issue instructions. So whilst it's not possible for me to state precisely what amounts to a reasonable time, there is an example in a 1980 decision called Boulder, London. Now, in that case, high was due on a Thursday, a notice was given on a Monday afternoon after inquiries had been made with the bank. This was found to be reasonable. Therefore, the answer is likely to be hours or a day or two at most. 
particularly as presumably now, it'd be rather quicker to make inquiries with a bank than it might have been in 1980 when that decision was made. In essence, an owner needs to act quickly. So an, an owner is allowed time to make inquiries with their bank to ensure that money has definitely not been received. It may also be reasonable for an owner to take time to consider their position and perhaps take legal advice. However, if there is a delay whilst making those inquiries, an owner must be very careful not to affirm the charter in the interim period. This could again be by words or by conduct. The same principle applies in circumstances where hire is short paid. An owner is again allowed a reasonable time to investigate the correctness of charterers' deductions from hire. So everything I've set up until now is on the basis that the charter does not contain a, contain a provision requiring an anti-technicality notice to be served prior to withdrawal. Anti-technicality clauses are now commonplace in time charters. One appears in the 1993 version of the NYPE form, I, I believe it's headed grace period, and also in the shell time form. Now, whilst their wordings are subtly different, their meaning and impact is the same. An anti-technicality clause is a clause designed to slightly soften the draconian consequences of the right to withdraw. In essence, an anti-technicality clause requires an owner to give, say, 48 or perhaps 72 hours notice to the charterers that a default has occurred and the ship will be withdrawn. In essence, the clause is designed to protect a charterer from a genuine mistake in paying late or short paying. Now, an anti-technicality notice can only be served once payment in, is late, now, this in practice usually means after midnight on the due day. The wording of the notice must be clear and unambiguous and comply with the precise terms of the clause in question. It also must be in absolute terms and make clear that an ultimatum is being given. That is, unless hire is paid within the set time period, the ship will be withdrawn. Now, that position was confirmed by the Court of Appeal in a decision called the Afavos. This issue was also considered by the court in the Lee High, which Tom mentioned to you a few moments ago. Now, as Tom explained, that case involved a short payment of hire in the sum of $500. Now, the Charter Party contained an anti-technicality clause, which hopefully will appear on your screen. Here we are. For anyone who's having trouble reading the screen, um, I'll read that out to you. So the Charter Party anti-technicality clause said, before exercising the option of withdrawing the vessel from the Charter, the owners will give the charterers 72 hours, Saturdays, Sundays and holidays and banking holidays excluded, official notice in writing and will not withdraw the vessel if the hire is paid or the alleged breach is rectified within the 72 hours allowed for notice from the time the charterers received such notice. Now, following that late payment or, um, or the short payment rather of, of $500, owners sent the following message to charterers. Again, it's on your screen, but I will read it out. Owners hereby give 72 hours notice that owners will withdraw the vessel from the service of the charterers without prejudice to any claims that owners may otherwise have upon the charterers. Now, you're going to have to bear with me here because I've not done this before, but I'm going to try and run a poll um, just to hopefully make this a bit more interesting. So based on what I've said about the requirements of an anti-technicality notice, do you think that the notice given in the Lehigh was valid? I will read out the notice again while you're thinking about that, and hopefully the poll will appear on your screens. So the notice said, owners hereby give 72 hours notice that owners will withdraw the vessel from the service of the charterers without prejudice to any claims that owners may otherwise have upon the charterers. So 58% of you, just the majority, thought that that notice was valid. 42% of you thought it was invalid. Goes to show I've not done a very good job yet of explaining what an anti-technicality notice needs to say. So what the court held in this case was that the notice was invalid. The reason was it did not give an ultimatum. So it didn't say that unless payment is made, the vessel would be withdrawn. Instead, it simply said, stated that as a, as a matter of fact, that in 72 hours, the vessel would be withdrawn. What the notice needed to say was owners hereby give notice, or 72 hours notice that owners will withdraw the vessel if payment is not made. So that was the bit that was missing. There was no ultimatum. So in that case, the court found that owners were in breach of the charter in withdrawing the vessel and were liable to the charterers in damages. This case, therefore, really shows the importance of ensuring that an anti-technicality notice is correctly drafted. So moving on to post-withdrawal. If an owner validly withdraws a vessel, the charter comes to an end. 
If after withdrawal an owner provides further services to the charterer, the owner may be entitled to remuneration for those services, but that will be under a new contract as the original charter will have come to an end, it no longer exists. It's however worth noting that Lord Denning expressed the view in a case called the Trop Wind, that where cargo is on board at the time of withdrawal and the owner carries it to the destination, he does so by way of fulfilling the original charter or bill of lading under which the owner may have separate obligations in any event and not in response to any request from the charterer. Now it's unclear whether that decision would remain today and the authors of time charters certainly suggest that where a new engagement by the former charterer can be inferred from the party's discussions or conduct, the owners will be re entitled to remuneration. This remains unclear. In essence, if you're dealing with this particular point, it's, it's, it's one that requires quite a lot of consideration. Now, similarly, if a sub time charterer who continues to make use, use of the ship after withdrawal from a time charterer, so we've got three parties in a chain, we've got a head owner, a time charter and a sub charterer. If the vessel has been withdrawn from the time charter in the middle here, this sub time charterer may be obliged to pay reasonable remuneration directly to the head owner. So in essence, they skip the middleman. If a charterer has paid higher for any period after withdrawal already, they're entitled to be refunded for that. And following withdrawal, an owner will remain bound by any bills of lading they've issued and will in any event probably have obligations as a bailee of any cargo on board. So a question that frequently arises is whether following a valid withdrawal by owners, the owner is entitled to damages for the loss of the charter. So that would be the loss caused by the market rate at the time of withdrawal being lower than the charter rate. The answer is that it will depend upon whether the failure to pay higher punctually is a condition or an innominate term. And we discussed what those meant in our, our first talk in this series. If it is a condition, then failure to pay on time is a repudiatory breach entitling the owners to damages for the loss of the bargain. However, if it's an, an innominate term, an owner would not be entitled to recover damages for loss of the bargain if their loss could fairly be said to have resulted from their own decision to exercise their option to terminate. Now, I'm going to be really mean to you again and run another poll, which is this. Do you think that failure to pay higher punctually is a breach of a condition or an innominate term? Now, hopefully the question will appear on your screen in a moment. Uh, this isn't a trick question, as for the last one. Uh, this is a question that has been rumbling through the courts for some time, and there have been decisions reached both ways. So it'd be interesting to see where where your views are. But there is now a, a standing position under English law, I should say, so I can give you an answer. But I suspect looking at the answers coming in, a few of you probably agree with the decision that was reached probably about seven or eight years ago now. So hopefully it will appear on your screen. 61% of you thought it would be a condition. 39% of you thought it was a nominate term. Well, that means 61% of you agreed with the court in the Astra. Now that was the 2013 decision. And that, in that case, the court held that, the, the, that failure to pay higher was a breach of condition. But that decision was subject to a great deal of criticism and uh, there was a, a lot of academic debate about it. And in 2016, so three years later, the issue was finally decided by the Court of Appeal, so a more senior court, in a case called Spa Shipping. And the court held that failure to pay an instalment of hire punctually was the breach of an innominate term, entitling the owner only to withdraw the vessel. There was no separate right to damages, unless of course some other separate breach can be identified. So as at today's date, as a, the current law is that a failure to pay um, hire punctually is breach of an, an innominate term, which does not entitle the owner to damages. Now, I'm going to hopefully hand back to Tom, deal with one or two final points. And I can see in the meantime, the number of you have been posting questions through. So I will have a look at those and we will answer some of those questions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, just to um, just to wrap up on this, then we're, we're nearly there now. Um, one point that it's worth just making in relation to um, the Astra and the spa shipping cases is that it can, um, in certain circumstances, be held that several um, missed hire instalments can amount to a repudiatory breach. Um, so you will you will come across cases in in, in certain circumstances where where repudiatory breach is established for non-payment of hire. 
Um, but the circumstances have to go to the root of the contract and generally the, the, by missing one installment of hire that won't be a repudiatory breach, as Sarah says. Um, just moving on and just moving on to our, our final slide then and, and just in relation to um, quantifying owner's damages claim where a, a repudiation or a repudiatory breach is established. Um, Sarah touched on it on, on a slide a couple of slides ago. Um, but essentially, the, me the measure of damages in those circumstances is the difference between the charter party rate and the market rate. So if your charter rate is, at, say, at $10,000 a day and your market rate is at $15,000 a day, then the owners would have a claim for that $5,000 a day difference. Um, and they'd have to give credit for any, um, you know, any, any hire that they made uh, in the meantime. Um, so in terms of commercial decisions as to whether or not to actually exercise a right to withdraw the vessel or to accept a repudiation of the charter party, um, some quite tricky considerations arise and there's an opportunity for owners um, sometimes to take advantage of this to, um, you know, to, to make sure that they get the, the best commercial outcome. Um, we haven't got time to go into these in, details, in detail today, but in very general terms, what tends to happen is that if the market rate is lower than the charter party rate, then owners may decide to keep the vessel in the charter party and not to withdraw or to accept the repudiation. Um, because in those circumstances, they may take the view that they're better off having the, the vessel in service at the old charter party rate. Whereas if the rate is higher, uh, the, the market rate is higher than the charter rate, then the owners may withdraw or accept the repudiation um, and then seek to fix the vessel at a higher rate. And if there's been a breach and a damages claim, then they may have a claim for the balance between the new charter rate and the market rate. So owners can seek to take advantage of that. Um, as I say, this, this can get quite quite tricky and quite complex, and, and we haven't got time to go through it in detail today. But if you ever find yourself in a, in a position um, where you're considering whether or not to withdraw the vessel or, or where you might have a damages claim, um, then these are the types of consideration that, that might arise. OK, and that, that brings us to the end of the talk. So just to summarise what we've looked at, um, we've had a look at the obligation to pay higher semi-monthly or monthly in advance. And we've, we've had a look at the time and the mode that charterers are obliged to uh, employ in order to make payment. Um, we've had a look at the circumstances where charterers might be entitled to deduct from hire. Um, Sarah's gone through withdrawal and anti-technicality notices in detail. Um, and then we've just touched on owners' potential claim for damages that might arise uh, as a separate uh, entitlement, uh, separate to the right of withdrawal. Um, and that concludes our talk. So. Um, now I think we can move on to take any questions that have cropped up during the last uh, last 40 minutes or so. Um. So perhaps Tom, I, I can take the first one. Um, there was one question that was pre-submitted to us with the uh, registration forms for this webinar. So I'll, I'll take that one whilst Tom's perhaps having a moment to read through. I can see that several have popped up on the screen. So um, I'll take this first one. The question that was asked is, is, is a very good one, which is if charterers don't pay a voyage expense other than hire, and the example given was armed guards, are they in breach of the obligation to pay higher? So the scenario that that person is asking about is where you've got a higher, a higher statement, which includes you know, 30 days or 15 days of hire, but also an additional sum, and in this case, armed guards, or for example, it could be additional war risk premium. So the starting point to, to dealing with this beat would be to check the charter carefully to see whether the additional charge made, so the armed guards, is, is legitimate. Now, if we assume it is, it is something the owners is in, are entitled to charge the charterers for, you would then need to check the clause allowing for that item to be charged to see whether it gives the owners any particular rights in the event of a failure to pay. Now, again, if we assume it doesn't say anything in particular, the starting point is at that point that the withdrawal clause that we've been discussing only relates to hire not to other sums. Therefore, provided the higher element has been paid in full, or, or I should say a sufficient sum has been received to cover the higher, if some other item has not been paid, then owners are unlikely to have the right to withdraw. However, I would add to that a note of caution. A, a charter keen to continue a charter would need to tread very carefully and see how an owner reacted in that sort of situation. Whilst there may not be a legal right to withdraw, an owner keen to, to end a charter early, so the examples Tom, Tom's just given, perhaps the market rate has picked up and the owner really wants to get this, this vessel back out into the market, that owner may try to use a non-payment of this other sum to argue that the charter is in repudiatory breach. 
So it's definitely one where a, a, a charterer would need to tread very carefully before not paying something which they are legally bound to pay under the charter. Now I can just see there's another one popped here. Perhaps Tom, this is a good one for you to take. Someone has asked, um, in the context of clause five of the NYE, NYP form, what is the meaning of or, or, or on any other breach of this charter party? Um, I don't know whether we can go back to your slide with that clause typed out for everyone to see. I don't know if Sophie, who's working in the background, can put the slides back on the screen um, and go back to, there we are, as if by magic. Um, <laughs> perhaps you can take that one, Tom. Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> just to summarise what I understand this question to mean, you'll see that the, the right to withdraw will arise uh, failing. So if we have a look at the middle line here, line 60, the right to withdraw arises failing the punctual and regular payments of hire or on any breach of this charter party. Um, and this was actually considered by, a, a, by the courts in a case called the Athos um, some time ago. And the point that was raised was that if any breach of the charter party by charterers gives rise to a right to withdraw, the result is pretty draconian. In, 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 in other words, if there, there can be just a minor breach and the owners have the right to withdraw the ship under, under the charter, which is obviously problematic for charterers, and gives the owners the right, or would give the owners the opportunity to perhaps uh, unfairly take advantage of, of minor breaches, to, you know, to, to further their commercial interests. And what the court actually held in the Athos in 1983 um, was that actually the applying a business common sense approach to this, what the reference to any breach of this charter party must mean is any repudiatory breach. So any serious breach that goes to the root of the contract would also give the owners the right to withdraw, but not just any breach. OK, so I hope that's reasonably clear. Thank you, Tom. Um, I can take one more here from the ones that are, are popping up now. Someone's asked, um, can charters make a deduction for anticipated off hire, which is yet to be agreed? The answer to that is no, they can't. Um, if a charter uh, makes a deduction um, for anticipated off hire, even if everyone knows that the vessel is going to be off hire in the next period, that's, that's it's not allowed. And that would mean that their payment is the payment of hire is a short payment and would therefore give the owners the right to withdraw, assuming there is a withdrawal clause and subject to any anti technicality provision within that charter. So even if it's you know, blindingly obvious to everyone, um, you've got to wait for that hire instalment to be due. Great. Um, there's another a slightly more complicated question here that I can um, I can do my best to answer. Um, but the, the, the question goes like this. So the charterer is a state owned company. Once the vessel is delivered, the charter, charterer considers the vessel to be off hire because some long surveys must be done before hire effectively kicks in. The state administration is very slow. So the surveys take a long time during which period the vessel is in the charterer's eyes off hire. Is there anything that the owners can do in those circumstances? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a tricky one, this. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the, the starting point, and it may not be a very um, helpful question, if sorry, a helpful response if this is a live situation that's actually occurred, but obviously the starting point is that the owners need to try to make sure that they don't expose themselves to this position in the terms of the time charter. Um, so try, try to include provisions that, um, you know, require things to be done within a reasonable time or within a certain time limit. Um, I think if owners find themselves in a the position where this is taking, you know, just an unreasonable amount of time, then it can be argued under English law that there is a, a, an implication of, of reasonableness in clauses like this. Um, so you can argue, um, a good example is if, if you have a settlement agreement, for example, or, or any agreement where there's an obligation on one party to pay, um, but there's no deadline set out in the agreement for payment, that doesn't entitle the paying party just not to pay because there's no deadline. It has to be taken to make the clause make sense that there must be some Im implied term of reasonableness there and they must pay within a reasonable time. You might be able to construct an argument along similar lines here that if the um, surveys go beyond whatever a reasonable period of time is, um, then owners may be able to argue that they can be you know, excused from the charter party or entitled to some other remedy. Um, but that would need some thinking through because we, we, we start to drift into you know, frustration territory. Um, and as, as anyone who's familiar with frustration will know, actually making out frustration can be very difficult. Um, so I'm afraid I think that the short answer here is that that's a tricky position for owners uh, if, the, if the terms of the charter really support charterers' position. Any thoughts, Sarah? 
I no, Tom, I agree with what you've said there. It's um, a rather unfortunate position for, for that party to be in, but I can't think of anything without looking at particular terms of that charter. I'd see if there's any other way that pressure can be put on put on them to speed up the process. Um, so no, I can't. One other question here that's come in. Um, can the charterer ask for damages if the owners have unlawfully withdrawn the vessel? Yes, they can. So if, as in the Lehigh, um, if the owner has unlawfully withdrawn, in that case, as we discussed, the reason the withdrawal was unlawful was because the anti-technicality notice um, didn't give an ultimatum. In that case, the, the charter was entitled to damages. So yes, they can. Uh, so that's the reason why, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, an owner withdrawing a vessel needs to be very careful. It's not something, I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't ever do it. Of course not. It's a, it's a powerful right for the owner to have. But if an owner is exercising their right to withdraw, they would need to tread very carefully, just making sure that they've you know, fully understood all of the charge party provisions and that they've ticked all the boxes, that the payment of the hire is indeed late, that the deductions, or if there is a deduction, um, we have, we're not lawful deductions and you know, follow the process, making sure everything is timed correctly and that if they are taking time to consider things, that they don't wait too long. Um, because if, if they get it wrong, there is a, is a right for the charterer to be paid damages, which obviously in the context of a long term time charter um, could be significant. Yeah, um, there's a good question here, um, which is, could you tell us what semi monthly means? So if, for example, the first hire instalment was due or the delivery date, the first hire instalment was due on the 5th of April, and when is the second instalment due on a semi-monthly basis? This is a very good question. And we, Sarah and I discussed this briefly last night, and we're not 100% sure um, exactly what the precise answer is to this question. I think in practical terms, the advice that we would give is that if you're in April, for example, which is a 31-day month, then the safe date for the second uh, instalment of hire would be 15 days later, i.e. the 20th. Um, I think if the first hire instalment fell due in February, um, then arguably in a normal year, semi-monthly would mean 14 days later. Um, but quite how that computes for subsequent months, um, I'm, not sure of the, um, I'm not sure of the answer to that as matters stand. What I will commit to do is um, we'll go away and actually just do a bit more research on this as much for our own uh, edification as for anyone else's because as I say this point um, this point arose to us when we were just preparing for this talk yesterday um, so we will try to bottom this one out and we'll circulate a note on it when we found the answer so but thanks for the question it's a good one. There's one more question here and perhaps um, this I think this is the last one I think we've covered them all um, someone's asked, um, what's a reasonable deduction? So if a charterer makes a deduction from hire, how can, I guess, an owner determine whether the, the deduction um, is one that they're entitled to make? So I guess the context would be here, if there has been a um, period of off hire, for example, and the charterer calculates how, how long the vessel was off hire for and makes a deduction, what if the charterer gets that wrong? Um, I, I guess is the question that's being asked. They, they miscalculate, they, they add a few hours more than they're, they're allowed to, or factually entitled to have. Well, that particular point, um, so looking at the quantum of a deduction, was considered by the, the court in, in a matter called the Nan Free, which is um, a few, few years ago now, it was a court of appeal decision. And the court in that case said that that a charter will not be in default if the, the permitted deduction, basically if the sum that they've, they've withheld was bona fide and, and assessed on a reasonable basis, I think is the wording. So that's, that's just looking at the quantum, not, not whether the vessel was in fact off hire. So if a charterer in those circumstances does their best to calculate off hire, you know, gets it wrong by an hour or two, then provided they did so in good faith, then that won't amount to a, a short payment for the purposes of, of withdrawal. Great. Yeah, I don't think, I think we've covered all of the questions there. If anything else crops up um, or if anyone thinks of anything after this, please do um, get in touch with us and, and we'll do our very best to assist. Yeah. So Sophie, if we could just go back to the final slides just to wrap up, that would be great. Thanks. So we are now halfway through our time charter programme. So you can see we've had our introduction. We've looked at uh, owners' obligations and charterers' rights, the duration of the charter, and today's talk, talk on hire and withdrawal. Uh, next up is the 5th of May, when Alex and Pamela will be talking to you about off-hire and damages. 
uh, picking up on some of those points in relation to off hire and equitable set off that we discussed briefly today. So please join us again for that one. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you all stay well. Um, good and enjoy the next couple of weeks. Thank you all.